the water, but we don't have water content. Yeah. Okay. 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 So, excuse me, are you Alex Gorbachev? I'm what? Alex Gorbachev on the speakers? No, I'm not here on the speakers today. Are you related to Gorbachev? No. I like it. I like it. Ah, no, no. Yeah. Oh, for me? Yeah. 
My job was listening in on the Russians with the Cold War. So you could see Russia from your window like the uh, bailout. <laughs> yeah, quite. Yeah. And then when college actually worked And then we came out here to see her. Thank you all. I would ask you if you can take your seats. You're starting. I'm here, Mr. Gorbachev. I would ask you if you can take your seats. Okay. Thank you all for coming here for our fourth of the Conquer Global Conversations and the last for this generation. Uh, here you can see how you can follow what's happening with our followers this year on our Instagram, on our Twitter account, and our Facebook account. Hungry Program exists since 78, so it's 40th anniversary, it's under umbrella of the Fulbright, brings for 10 months of academic experience the best people from countries around the world. It's highly competitive and very prestigious. They get to spend 10 months in the universities across the nation, not only journalism, there's also law, human rights, public services, and then they get to work uh, in the American organization, like our fellows will be going to do their professional affiliations in the uh, beginning of the May, mostly in some <coughs> outlets in New York, LA, with DC, or elsewhere. This is this year's generation of the fellows, we have 11 fellows from 10 different countries, and you have, you have the on, on the on the table there are bios and emails if you're interested to get to know them better more deeply. This is all the all the conversations that we had since the beginning of February. You can find them on our YouTube channel. They are all recorded and right now we are live streaming and maybe some people on the other side of the globe are watching us now. So please feel free to go to the YouTube channel Kronk at HHH and uh, watch the previous uh Global Conversations. So today, I'm, I'm trying to be fast, so they have more time to actually talk about the topics. We have Alex Gorbachev from Russia and Balan Zalai from Hungary, I hope I pronounced it well. <laughs> and they will be talking about the government in Russia and in Hungary today. So the floor is, first is Alex Gorbachev, he will speak for 20 to 23 minutes, then you will have five minutes questions, and then you will have Balan, and then you have questions for him. Thank you. Which one is Thanks for coming, guys. My presentation will be really short and it's going to be more like discussion, not like a presentation. It's going to be a story of my country and it's also going to be a personal story. I'm very, actually, it's, today is a very special day for me and it's a very sad day for Russia because exactly four years, years ago, on February 27, 2015, a friend of mine and Russian opposition leader Boris Nemtsov was murdered in Moscow city center. He was a big critic of Vladimir Putin. This is quotation, one of his last interviews, uh, when he claimed Putin as totally a moral human being. I worked with him tightly. He was a good friend of mine. And I remember the day vividly. My friend just called me and said, Boris, 
is murdered. And I'm like, I was sleeping already. And I'm like, it's a bad job too. And he's like, I'm not kidding. And we drove to the Moscow city center. We saw a bunch of police cars in front of Kremlin. And the sense of fear fulfilled us. I want to show you one of this video just to uh, make a sense what kind of person he was. interference to, to Ukraine. He was against annexation of Crimea. He was biggest critic of Vladimir Putin. Of course, that critique and that couldn't last long. Я уверен в том, что это политическое убийство, и именно за это ответственны верховные власти. I have a question to you. Could you imagine one day waking up in the country where government deprives you from your freedom? Well, that happened to me, and that happened to me twice. First time, it was when Putin became a president of Russia. Second time, when Boris Nemtsov was murdered, because at that moment, Russia became not only oppressive, but also dangerous. I have a question to you. Does she seem like a criminal to you? Look at the picture of this lady with her two kids. What do you think? Well, she is a criminal. And her only crime is that she wasn't afraid to protest against Putin. She wasn't afraid to wear a yellow t-shirt against Putin. She wasn't afraid to make a picture in front of American Congress, uh, like many of us, by the way, did. She wasn't afraid to protest. Now she is under house arrest for being a good citizen. And the only, we have hundreds of these stories, unfortunately, every year in Russia. And the only way, uh, the only thing why I brought it up, because it's also ruined her life. She had three kids, and when she was in prison, uh, when she was under house arrest, one of her daughters were placed into urgent care unit in critical condition. It took 24 hours to get the permission from the judge just to see her dying daughter. And two hours after her visit, she passed away. Now, uh, this Anastasia Shevchenko, who is brilliant person and activist under house arrest. But majority of Russian people have never seen, have never heard, will never see, will never hear the story about her daughter, will never see her appear in the court. Because Russian government unfortunately uses its media to spread propaganda and disinformation mostly. I have a question to you. Can you raise your hands? Uh, how many of you have seen this logo in your social me media, Facebook, Twitter account? Not that many, but and that's and that's good. But unfortunately, Russia today is very active uh, in Europe, in Russia, and 
part, partially in the United States. Uh, it's funded by the Kremlin, and I brought some statistics because uh, in Russian government, I counted, right? only according to official data, Russian government takes three, more than three billion dollars from filter Russian budget when uh, to fund this propaganda media outlet and disinformation, while Russian citizens, especially retired, have to survive uh, on $200 per month. And I can assure you that prices in Moscow are pretty similar to Phoenix prices. Russian TV also would never tell you about participation of young Russian citizens in the elections just because they are against Russian government. And Russian, gov uh, Russian TV will never show you, for example, this video. Сегодня 80% ветеранов военной службы получают пенсию в пределах 7-9 тысяч рублей. Ну, это или столько, столько, столько получают трудовую пенсию, как в некоторых случаях книжки. А младшие... I think it's disgusting, isn't it? For this video. It's parade on the 9th of the May when Russia was praising its veterans. I will just show it to you again and look at the veterans. <laughs> And we had a bunch of these videos on, on YouTube uh, of the way how Putin security behaves with ordinary people. But unfortunately, this is the only video, a video I found because YouTube cooperates with Russian government and he deleted all the videos about it. So another question for you folks. Can you listen to picture of Putin with sailors or like someone and with just ordinary people in the church? What do you think? Can you find some people uh, which are similar? Which face, uh, which faces look familiar to you on both pictures? Oh, yeah. Nice, nice, nice. So, according to official position of Kremlin, Putin just invited sailors, sailors to the church, but you can mention that we, he wore completely different clothes. So, highly likely. He just surrounded himself with former, uh, with uh, actually agents, because he's afraid. He's afraid to talk to Russian people because he doesn't want to hear the truth. But what Russian people would see and have seen is this: Russian leader Vladimir Putin is treated like a rock star with his own personal propaganda song, which they sing at his rallies. <laughs> Sometimes people try to copy it. also use kids in their political com campaign but I personally against it because against this exploitation of children because I don't think that they are aware of political use so unfortunately Russian media now are uh, struggling with the regime and 
the most controversial topic for Russian media are Russia-US relation, Russia-EU relation, and Russian-Ukrainian relations. Because journalists, actually, they don't have the permission to uh, express their own opinion. Majority of journalists who work for state-owned media uh, outlets or uh, some private outlets, they have to follow government's line. So they are kind of a force to ex exercise self-censorship, uh, unfortunately. And I have a quiz for you. Uh, I collected some headlines of Russian media outlets, like big one. And I want to ask you, what do you think, uh, what do you think these headlines are true or, false, true or false? First one, Poland to leave the EU. False. Is it true or false? Well, some guys in Poland want to, but... Uh, is that going to happen? Yeah. Yeah. This is false, and this was based just on the one statement of former Polish Prime Minister Don Donald, uh, Donald Tusk, who urged Poland to stop blackmail Brussels. Otherwise, it might cause the consequences. But there is no, there are not any discussions in Poland about leaving the EU. Uh, no one discusses this in the ruling party. Over 10 million Ukrainians left uh, left country uh, because of pro-NATO uh, pro-NATO uh, pro course. No. No. So this is also false. And it was based, again, on one interview on, on one Ukrainian pro-Russian politician who just said that without any data. And the only reason, uh, so journalists started to count. Actually, there are some Ukrainians who left uh, Ukraine. It was from two to four million, but no one asked them why they left. And Maybe it has nothing to do with war, you know? Yeah, they could just go to work. Uh, U.S. preparing to overthrow the Hungarian government. What do you think? Is it true or false? Ah, <laughs> false. doesn't sound any plausible. Mm -hmm. When when was it, by the way, posted? Mm -hmm. A couple of weeks ago. Whoa! They all are pretty fresh, like last month. Oh, mm -hmm. that that sounds. So do you think it's true or false? false. Oh, Especially wow. like false. <laughs> this is also false. Uh, false. Uh, mm -hmm. It was based on just one bill introduced to. American Congress, where two, senat uh, two senators are urged uh, to make a resolution about human rights violations in Hungary. Ukraine's parliament allows expired products to be sold to consumers. We have a guest from Ukraine. Do you think it's true or false? I have, like, from my own experience, if I ever see it, I would like to go to the court, right? And sue the show that sold it sold in those states. So, so the, no. The only and there was a huge discussion about it because the young, because all this headlines were posted by big media outlets. Not, it's not just I found it somewhere, like outlets. It's big Russian, uh, Russian outlets. So they just decided to make this headline after Ukraine implemented new law, according to which uh, they started uh, the regulations must follow European regulations. So on some particular products, they cannot. Uh, mark day uh, day of expiration of products but only months and year but it's only for some particular products not for meal or something and the last one hungarian teenagers kill ukraine ukrainian war in boy in transfer back you cannot say it's true or false no one can say this because this story had a video it had a not video sorry photo it had a uh, mother's story on facebook and it's hard, it was a heartbreaking story until uh, Transcarpathian police, police announced that actually such a crime never occurred uh, in Transcarpathia. So the only reason why this fake story was published because now the Russian government uh, wants to make a schism between Hungary and Ukraine. Uh, divide and conquer. Yeah. But, but they do it actually. Now we have a lot of time. Russian journalists who spread this propaganda and disinformation. Do you feel? Uh, do you think that they do it because they actually believe in it, or because, uh, uh, or because of other reasons? What is your opinion, guys? Hmm? Is anyone who thinks that they believe in the stuff they are saying? Well, it's tough to believe in the stuff if you uh, like. If you devise it yourself, so if you think of the news and make them and write them, and <laughs> so it's it's like yeah. tough for a storyteller to believe in his own yeah. story, right? Yeah, that's right, Krishna. So of course they do not believe. They're smart people, 
And for example, I just brought up two, two picture of this uh, popular Russian TV anchors. This one, Sergei Brilov, uh, his TV channel twice already announced about nuclear missiles to bomb the United States. Some of you could heard it recently in the news. So he shouldn't care about it because he is uh, the citizen of United Kingdom and he has a property there and he actually confirmed it. The second one who loves Putin, Vladimir Solovyov, who made a, a film, a movie about annexation of Crimea, he actually liked to spend his vacation at Como Lake uh, in Italy. And I just brought, brought, you, brought up a few media outlets recently shut down in Russia. New Times, the only magazine who claimed Putin responsible for murder of Boris Nemtsov. Novy Zvestia, a pretty good newspaper, critical to government. Kimersant Plast, uh, it's actually a magazine where I started my career with an article about fraud uh, at the election at, more, um, at the Moscow city parliament. And Moscow Times, yeah. the only English newspaper in Moscow. Don't you all they shut down their printed editions, unfortunately. And, and by the way, many, uh, I work in Kiev Post, and many journalists from there went to Ukraine and work now in Kiev Post. Some of them are still exist, but in digital and no one actually knows. Actually, uh, actually, my website was also blocked in Russia. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Russian popular. Yeah. Right? yeah, so we have just one independent, semi-independent TV channel, so it's nothing. And so I collected for you top 10 Russian media outlets. What do you think? How many of them are still independent uh, among 10? Do you have any guesses? One. Uh, two. Hmm? A little one on the left here, on the bottom. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. So it's not one, but it's almost one. Almost all of them. Like we have. Just a few independent, the ones like national, the ones with whom everyone reads. We also have a lot of brainstorm schools in Russia. Hundreds of journalists were from school in the country. I'm one of them. And 149 journalists were killed in 2000 and 2019 uh, through the Putin's era. You, you might ask me, and what about Russian opposition? Why you guys don't do anything? And maybe people doesn't want to. Maybe people doesn't want to go to meetings against Putin. And in the end of my presentation, I will just show you a short video, which pretty much shows you what happened with the people who comes to the meeting, the peaceful meeting in Moscow city center, just to protest, and with a civil protest, sometimes without even uh, without even a sign. Uh, but I must, I, I want to inform you that this, vid uh, this video contains some sensitive and disturbing content. So I hope you're okay with it. This was final video I wanted to show you. My goal now as an independent journalist, I've got, there's not that much we can do, but these people you saw in picture, they're criminals. People who are beaten, uh, peaceful protesters, many of them are like just the kids who just didn't know the consequences, what will happen if they will come to meeting and who believe that they can peacefully protest in their country. Uh, these paramilitary groups you saw on the picture with military, uniform for beat uh, protesters with the bigs. Uh, 
our goal now <laughs> with my friends and colleagues is to create a database where these pictures and last names and first names of these people will appear. And we want to prosecute them and make sure that after the regime change, these people will be <laughs> prosecuted because of the crime they did. Thank you so much. I have a couple of minutes for questions, and after I will have, I will give a word for my colleague from Hungary. We have six minutes for questions. So uh, let's go from Larry and after. So my question is, how, given given your political point of view towards the government, is it safe for you to be in? Was has it been safe for you to be in Russia and do what you're doing? And is it safe for you to return to Russia? It's not safe. It's safe to be in Russia, but it's not safe to work in Russia. This meeting you saw is actually one of the last meetings I covered as a journalist. And it was scary because when you're like when you're a male like uh, my age, it's kind of likely you will be beaten or arrested. So it's not safe to do my work if you don't have a journalist. And, uh, I, w I want to be politically active and unfortunately it's not safe at all. You could see uh, mother of two children children who was in prison just because she she was a good citizen. The only accusation against her is cooperation with unreliable organizations, which are which actually organizations which uh, against Vladimir Putin. Sorry. Maria first, Krzysztof, and after I will. The thing is, uh, you, you probably know we have like a war in our country. Mm -hmm. You can call it a war, but it is. And when you say, I hope when the regime is over, yeah, people will come, new people will come to power, into power. But I question whether this regime will ever change. Because from what I think is, I think my country is being punished for, for the revolution we wanted to have, yeah, but for exactly. these changes we wanted so desperately, you know? And uh, I have friends that died, and uh, my good friends. So, what makes you think that Russia will ever change? Ever. Uh, not, I'm not talking about death of Putin, but like ever. It's, you always have a call to your country. When, on the war, when Putin started the war against Ukraine, Russian civil society, we tried to do uh, everything to interfere, uh, to prevent it, but unfortunately we were not powerful enough. And we couldn't stop Putin from interference of Ukraine and from annexation of for me, and uh, I personally feel very sorry about that. As for changing the regime, no one could predict that the uh, Soviet Union will collapse. So I don't know if it will change and when it change. We only can hope. We always have the hope, right? Hmm. What are the main points of this agreement between Putin and the opposition to Putin when it comes to, for example, economic policy? Are there any real disagreements or is it just about changing uh, the level of uh, civil rights etc and changing the people without really changing the system uh, with, economic, with economic policy there are some just minor disagreements uh, but, uh, major 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 disagreements are about uh, politics like not economic but political system in Russia because actually uh, it's very hard to make a business in Russia when you know that uh, I don't know secret services can come and ask you for your money otherwise you will be imprisoned and we have hundreds dozens hundreds of dozens of such cases unfortunately so major disagreements are related to political system has the support of the Trump administration changed the reaction to the independent media over the over the past years, do you think that's a correlation? Uh, I, I'm not sure I understood your question. What, what it, do you mean? With the overt support of the Trump administration to the policies of the Putin administration, has that had an impact on the ability of the free media to work? Uh, no, it had impact on uh, state-owned media because they started to praise Trump before the election. Uh, and actually no one really believed that he will win, but they started to praise him like he's a good politician. He wants uh, peace with Russia, but he will never win. And it's like crooked Hillary, he will win. And when he became a president, they did, obviously didn't know what to do because uh, <laughs> Russian propaganda claimed that he will remove sanctions as soon as he will uh, be in Washington, and it didn't happen. 
So they started to be neutral about him. As for in independent media, they are very usually they are very like biased towards America because like America is for de supports democracy in Russia. Putin is bad. Uh, American president is good. It was with Obama, but with Trump it changed because uh, new American government they doesn't care about human rights in Russia. Uh, new, not government, White House administration. So it just changed the uh, Russian opposition and uh, the liberal media started to be more critical uh, towards current American administration. We have time for one more question. Yeah, please. How do you navigate your job considering how dangerous it is to <laughs> report in Russia? <coughs> uh, I don't know. I just feel that this is my vocation, that I uh, this is my what I can do to change the regime. and. Uh, at least I can expose this, at least I can write about it, at least I can show you the video about it. Because when I worked on this presentation, it was so hard to find a video with, with a good quality. Uh, the video is, uh, the video I put it here, it was posted by bloggers, because it's, there, there, uh, there are no any Russian TV channels at all who covered any of these rallies or anything. And YouTube deleted a lot of videos with uh, violations of the police and so on. So it's hard, but I think that my goal as a journalist to expose it, that's not my but at least that's what I can do. Thank, Thank, you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think the IT is taking over. So, hello everybody, I'm Balin Tsai, I'm a Disney journalist from Hungary, and um, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a pretty big uh, uh, task to, to show how our current system works, uh, or has been working in the last eight years, so I will just uh, give a, um, a glimpse of the framework, uh, and also a lot of examples, so you will get a taste that uh, that uh, what is it like uh, working in Hungary nowadays? And I, I just chose this uh, title because that that's one of the main uh, realization of Hungarians that everybody took it for granted that history always goes forward as a progression and development, and it definitely doesn't. Like it can go back pretty quickly with the right tools. Um, so first of all, I will just make a short introduction about how how this franchise of uh, not democratic but absolutely not total, totalitarian regimes uh, emerged uh, basically everywhere in the world. It's getting like popular, uh, and uh, two of the and then uh, like highlight two of the main uh, features of the regime: the total disinformation and the systematic level of corruption. Um, uh, and uh, I will finish it with uh, some expectations as well. So first of all, like uh, after the fall of the Soviet Union, it was like uh, a big relief for everybody. Everybody wanted the democracy for sure. But uh, as you look at all these people, they had no idea what democracy actually looked like. Most of the people in the Eastern Bloc was like oppressed brutally. Some of them like medium brutally, some of them just slightly better. But not even their parents knew how to operate it in a more open or let's call like a normal democracy. So, but you know, they were pretty keen on it and they still keen on it. Um, the, the biggest uh, stuff, the biggest like uh, reason why democracy could uh, remain in this area, because we got loads of uh, conditional grants. We got grants from the US, we got grants from UN, we got grants from EU, or with the, even from IMF or World Bank. Uh, all with certain conditions of getting more democratic processes uh, uh, involving more transparency. And, you know, we were in need of that money because 
without the free people exit. So to everybody, even the, the harshest communist uh, uh, views that reforms and democratic procedures became like quite common and sort of stable. Um, Um, but after these grants were gone, all sorts of um, so-called illiberal ideas um, came through, which, uh, which basically mean that, uh, that uh, we just want to look democratic, we can hack the, this whole system from the inside. And, um, and uh, this whole, any kind of like, this kind of illiberal idea is just uh, based on that we can keep the uh, free election process and, uh, and mess up all the other institutions of democracy. Uh, and uh, we even, but we have to keep, every, basically everybody in the world uh, tries to keep in the name democracy, even North Korea is Democratic People's Republic of North Korea or some other oppressive, oppressive regimes like the Democratic Republic of Congo is really keen on putting even uh, in the name of democracy. So if we made other, we made other names for this, this kind of hack democracies, like illiberal democracy, Christian democrat democracy, or I don't know, people's democracy, Islam democracy. I actually we use, we were illiberal democracy for a few years, but nowadays we, we are using Christian democrat democracy, everything. It all refers to it's like not the liberal one, but the other one. But there is no such thing as not liberal democracy because it's about the rules. Even the even with an ultra conservative government view, democracy will stay liberal because uh, uh, because uh, even those uh, those people's rights will be protected who are opposing the government. That's like pretty basic. Um, so I just want to show some characteristics how how the system is hacked from the inside. Like um, we saw all these violent videos from Russia, but uh, but uh, nowadays it's like totally uncool to beat up protesters and I don't know like kidnap people or kill the opponents. But if you have all the regulatory power, you just shouldn't do that. It's like former minister of economy of Hungary um, and now the head of the Hungarian National Bank. Um, he claimed pretty openly uh, sometimes that uh, if you don't sell your company for a reduced price to us, we will make it go broke. So people just uh, sold their companies um, to the persons they should sell the companies. Also, uh, you, you, you really need, uh, uh, you, you don't want to ban opposition parties, you don't want to ban uh, Free media because uh, because it just looks ugly and everybody can understand that it's bad and it's undemocratic. You just want to keep a tiny token kind of opposition and tiny token uh, free media. I will talk about the media later, but it uh, it really shouldn't be bigger that you can't silence immediately if something important happens. Also, it's very good if you if you keep some keep the opposition in the parliament because you can pacify them if you can give them. Um, age and their good life, and also you can monitor them. They, they won't do any underground movements, and, uh, and um, also sometimes you can even buy them up. I'm, I'm pretty sure I won't hurt the feelings of Jinovsky from Russia or George Bonar from Hungary, who are opposition figures, but they are pretty directly controlled by the government. Um, also, it's, it's insane, like it's really 20th century method to, to ban NGOs. You just want to break them totally that they will shut up, basically. Uh, or you, was, like, you just want to reach su such a kind of self-censorship after all kinds of harassments from authorities, police, uh, tax authority, everything you can imagine, that, uh, that they will stop their operations or, or just stay silent. And also, it's like very common, you know, in these so-called illiberal countries that use the, that the, for civil movements they use government-organized uh, non-governmental organizations, which are like gongos. But actually, in Hungary, the biggest NGO in Hungary is organized and funded by the by the government, 
uh, and its sole purpose is to organize protests uh, uh, for the government and against immigration uh, for the peace march and they do the logistics uh, for that and all the, uh, all the other jobs. Also, it's like um, you've seen the brutal beatings, it just looks awful on pictures. You don't definitely don't want to do that. You, you have to outsource all the violence to traditional youth groups or uh, football supporters or um, private armies, uh, everything you can imagine. Here is that um, one opposition MP wanted to file a proposal for referendum, but somehow uh, in, uh, 15 uh, bald guys emerged from nowhere and physically stuck him to do that. Uh, uh, media identified several of these, um, of these bald guys, um, uh, but unfortunately police couldn't identify any of those. Uh, they can be really sloppy sometimes with these issues. Uh, also, this, this is a conversation which uh, is completely imaginary. I just made it up, um, but it has um, some pieces of truth. Uh, if you hear somebody, some politician um, claiming all the time about their sovereignty and, uh, and referring to that they are the elected members and bureaucrats and activists can tell them what to do, it's basically a quite common argument in the last 10 years in the era. I just wanted to choose a uh, personality who is like quite unattackable personally, but actually the we did use, uh, Orban did use uh, uh, for campaigning that our first and foremost goal is ethnic homogeneity. And uh, it's a really common argument that, uh, that uh, foreign political activists just shouldn't interfere in our sovereign nation's way of doing things. Also, this kind of, um, how to organize countries like this with um, free elections, but nothing else free, like, you know, like all the rules of the game set to the government. So they are basically unchangeable. So this is, this is almost like a franchise and uh, this franchise is, is really heavily organized by, or has, was organized by this big five nations, Russia, China, Saudi Arabia, Iran, and Venezuela. For us, Russia was the main model because they were physically the closest and also with cultural ties, but uh, we get all kinds of know-how, help, um, institutions, um, uh, materials, fake think tanks, fake experts, everything you can imagine. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's a really a big help for these uh, regimes and it's, uh, and it's becoming uh, like more and more popular to use them and more and more open. And but one of the other main characteristics is like, which is essential to the system is like total disinformation. There are like a bit, uh, bit much of data over there, but I just wanted to, want to refer to that stuff that uh, the Hungarian government bought up around uh, uh, 500 media outlets, nearly all of the media outlets in Hungary, like uh, all of the, nearly all of the radio stations, nearly all of the TVs, nearly all of the newspapers, nearly all of the news sites, like uh, uh, they're really, really a tiny piece of independent media left. And uh, the government uh, media is organized under a central basically agency. It's, it has got a different name and they are synchronizingly pushing really simple messages, but uh, all the time everywhere from billboards to TVs to radios, you can't go to the hairdresser not hearing constantly government messages. You can't uh, go to a municipality building. Uh, you can't even watch the better report without getting constantly pushed into you that, uh, I don't know, US bad, Russia good, US bad, Russia good. It's like not, it's sometimes not even full sentences. Uh, I will show you some examples. And this really like, I can, I'm not, um, making an exaggeration of this carpet bombing uh, examples because then, yeah, and it's like we are heavily dependent on fake news, mostly fueled by uh, Russian fake news factories. But now, nowadays we, are, we can produce our very own ones as well. And uh, we, have, uh, we have gone into more and more into a um, hateful and uh, racist um, tone, which is, I don't know why it's necessary, but you know, they just felt that it's effective, I think. 
it's definitely effective. It's like uh, it can. I'm pretty sure if you know, you can imagine like it's it's almost like North Korea. I'm pretty sure if if you um, if you would experience uh, the same kind of bombing for like four or five years about like colored people are not as human beings as we are, maybe uh, maybe about like half of the room would would be a bit a bit like uncertain about that maybe they may have some clues because all kinds of horrible things are happening uh, and stuff like that and it's like it's a, it's the repetitive attack against the brain it's not shouldn't be undervalued it's uh, it's got immense power i couldn't believe it earlier now i totally believe it that it, it works like terribly the, the main message is that we are constantly in a war against somebody we had some semi good uh, uh, arch enemies before the INF, the speculants, the international day of the, the bureaucrats in Brussels, but um, we finally found the perfect enemy, the immigrant and George Soros, who is a millionaire with Hungarian ancestry, and he's a philanthropic, and uh, uh, he supports some kind of uh, legalized uh, immigration process in the EU as well. Uh, so in the last three years, we are completely focused on Soros and immigration, that uh, Immigrants are basically only trying to rape our children and uh, and um, and kill us instantly. Take our culture, take our money. And George Soros is a Satan who is like you cannot argue with him. He somehow gets money if, if Hungary will get infested with uh, with uh, all these burnings. Uh, I just want to make sure I'm listening correct. Immigrants that come to Hungary or like the, uh, like Immig all the immigrants want to come to Hungary. In, oh. in, in, oh. in, in, in the real world, nobody wants to come to Hungary, but uh, you know, as we are at the southern border, you, it was easy to say that you know, if they don't stop them, they will just, they won't, they will just want to come but to Hungary. But the thing is, Hungarian government actually invites people from Western Ukraine to kind of you but, know, to. But it's a, it's a secret program. Oh. You, uh, everybody who makes it public, it's like, a, it's like an open offense against the government. So immigrants are bad. Yeah. We have no immigrants, but they are bad. Yeah. So they are just trying to get uh, some type of immigrants, so that immigrants from uh, Western Ukraine, but trying to yeah, restrict actually, other... actually, we want to get all kinds of immigrants because there is a huge labor shortage. But on in the propaganda, it's like every immigrant is bad, basically, who is not Christian, Hungarian. So actually, even uh, even uh, Orban wants actually these immigrants from the south. Actually, it's, it's, it's not about ideology, it's about like propaganda stuff. Maybe it will change in two years, who knows? Like the, the economy definitely needs uh, extra workers. Uh, they use extra workers, mostly from Ukraine, but now we are using from anywhere. Uh, they use even from workers from Mexico, but it should be kept in secret because the main propaganda is that all immigrants are animals. What is the level of social benefits and spending and similar uh, like bad initiatives for immigration in uh, Hungary. It's it's, uh, it's, 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 it's it's quite a hard question because uh, because uh, there are diff very different kind of immigration processes uh, in uh, in Hungary. But we can talk after. I just want to show you how how the propaganda works. It's like billboard everywhere. Only this billboard is not. Uh, uh, government on it's, uh, it's basically saying Soros is having an evil laughter at the billboard and uh, the, the billboard is saying don't let Soros have the last laughter. Uh, also, these are different daily newspapers, all with the same huge advertisement. Um, it's against Soros because he has a plan to ruin Hungary. All the underground against Hungary and is proud and strong. Hungary is proud and strong European nation, and you know, don't let us infest with the uh, immigrants. Or the, the, this is some, I think it's a municipality building, it's even on the floor. Um, this is from last week, like this is the new campaign. You have the right to know what this Brussels is up to. Basically, they want to infest us with immigrants, and with Soros and uh, Juncker from the EU, uh, all the billboards in the countryside. Um, <coughs> And you know it's um, it's a signature like um, it's harsh propaganda made people even harsher. They hate Soros extremely. It's written stinking Jew, but it's we thought that this kind of uh, 
anti-Semitism and racism is like over in the in the last 15 years, but it definitely came back. Um, and Gavin MP uh, shared this picture uh, from his friend. It's a killed and burnt pig, and it's written there, he was Shorosh. It's also a word game that uh, it can mean he was he is the next. Or, or something like that. Um, and it's like, you know, it's it's quite common to play this kind of word games in Hungarian politics that uh, you can understand this way or that, that way because, you know, it's totally uncool to be anti-Semitic in the EU, but it's totally cool inland, so, you know, you have to play with it all the time. Also, being racist is getting a bit cooler in the region. You, have, you can be more open about that. Is there any uh, anti-Semitism other than against Soros, who is a Jew, but it's, it's not yeah. his main feature, right? He's... Can I ask you to keep that until the end? Okay, okay, sorry, sorry. sorry. Yeah, we can talk about this. The, the, other, the other main characteristic is systematic corruption because that's how this, the whole party is um, organized under. It's, not a, it's basically not a goal to get party members richer. It's a, it's a tool to keep the party totally alive and thriving. These are just two prominent members. None of them are party members. They are just um, helpful experts. One of them is um, uh, Fidesz, the ruling party's main ideologist. He openly claimed that uh, what people call corruption, it's the ruling party's main ideology, uh, main policy. The other is uh, Vida Yediko. Uh, she was the uh, head of uh, the Hungarian Tax Authority. Um, they heard, uh, I, a U.S. company complained that um, that somebody uh, went to them and uh, and offered that no, they, a U.S. company complained that some of its Hungarian competitors can cheat with tax, so they got got a a, a reoffer from the tax authority that uh, that you can also cheat with tax if you pay a couple of million dollars to this uh, zombie think tank of Fidesz. Um, so finally, and the company reported it to the U.S., so she was banned. Uh, from US among uh, seven other unknown uh, government officials. This is basically the, one of the other symbols of corruption. That is the, the village of Felchut, hometown of our prime minister. The red dot is the house of Orban. He just built a, a, a stadium next to his uh, uh, house because he really loves football. The whole village is less than 2,000. The stadium can hold 4,000 people. Uh, you can imagine how necessary that was. They play in the first league. Um, basically, they are the second or the first richest team in the Hungarian league right now. Uh, it's insane. Also, the, he is the richest. This one is the rich, richest guy in Hungary. He's a plumber from uh, this village, Felchut, and he was a close friend of Orban. Uh, his, um, there is serious assumptions that he is not collecting. Uh, his money for himself, but for for the family of Orban, he was like a nobody ten years before, and he's he's now he's a billionaire even in dollars nowadays, only for from public procurement. Um, he is among with his supporters. Everybody is looking at if the, if the big man likes the food or not. But uh, but um, basically, he got faster. He got faster rich than Zuckerberg did after Facebook, and then he was presented with this fact. He just claimed that maybe I'm smarter than Superbird. <laughs> uh, I just want to show a short video about like, you know, this is the this is the absolute like it's a good example about Hungarian internal public debate because it can show that uh, it can it can show that uh, that there is no internal debate, it's just shouting of political slogans, and everybody who is not shouting them is like a traitor and Oh, and it's about uh, uh, a non-governmental, but the government supporting uh, government supporting uh, um, journalist asking questions from Franz Timmermans, um, a leading figure in the European Socialist. No, 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 from the people, from the people say, not uh, government media. What are you doing here, sir? Hungarian, Hungarian people not do not want uh, European Commission plan. Why do you talking about, sir? refugees and uh, we don't want we don't want no Fidesz. I am I am the people. 
Yes, 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 yes. No refugees. We are uh, Hungarian people here, live it there. Mm -hmm. But there is no plan. Oh, lying, lying, lying. Well, you know, lying. you should be, perhaps you should be reading a bit more and asking a bit more. There is no plan to bring uh, refugees in Hungary. There is no plan to dilute the Hungarian. This is lie. You know, you know this is lie. Okay. This so is lie. Why, why are you asking? We build, we build the wall. We build the wall. The Hungary, we, we build in the, in the borders wall. You build the wall? Yes, wall. yes. We, we are the people want. Uh -huh. Not the Fidesz, not the Orban. Mm -hmm. we, people do not want uh, refugees here. Mm -hmm. We see, we see what uh, what kind of life in the French, in the Belgium, in the... Uh, look at my country. I don't want, I, I fear, I fear, I fear. I am, afraid? I am sec yes, 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 I am sec here. Where is You're afraid? You, here, there, there. You're afraid? We are a bit short on time, but it's like, it goes on in an uncomfortable way. Like yeah, um, but it's like, it's about not reasoning, it's about not, not even asking um, a real question, it's just telling somebody that you're a liar and, you know, shouting it louder than the any others. So what can we expect from Hungary with this possibly like falling competitiveness, education and innovation processes? Uh, because, you know, that's, that's um, more the main characteristics of these kind of regimes. EU, was definite, EU definitely can't stop this because it was not designed for internal enemies. And all other entities are seem to have their own uh, private deals with the government. Um, uh, even, you know, we can sell criminals or basic, basically we can do anything for, for the right deal. Um, and uh, also we want to spread our knowledge of um, illiberal regimes. Uh, and we already started it. This is like Bloomberg's collection and it's mostly accurate. Uh, it's a bit, uh, yeah, it's mostly accurate. It's about we are buying up media outlets, like the party middlemen are buying up media outlets uh, or monopolies in the region so they can finance uh, other illiberal kind of potential allies um, uh, in the neighboring countries. Um, thank you for your questions. Now, all the questions. <laughs> Uh, thank you for a very interesting presentation. Uh, I want to ask to first repeat my uh, your earlier question: If in Hungary is there really uh, like big anti-Semitism, or is it just anti-Sorosism? Because well, Soros is a Jew, but he is not just a Jew. He's a multimillionaire, and he has own own views, and he has his own actions. So they might be hating Soros, but yeah. It's, a, it's hard to measure anti-Semitism, but... Uh, Is it as help. big as in Germany or smaller? Very bigger. But, uh, well, but you know, if, if, if you measure it, that, you know, would you, uh, how much would you like if a Jewish person would, uh, would uh, move to your neighborhood, then it is big. Ah. It. And, it's, it, and it's basically on the rise in, in like, in hand in hand with the uh, hate against Jewish. Yes. Okay, so uh, our journalists from Kiev for the newspaper where I work, mm -hmm. they went to uh, Hungary to do research because we really had this crisis. Not crisis, like it, it's more of a misunderstanding on the border. Because many people in Ukraine, they speak, I just want to make my point, mm -hmm. they speak Hungarian. And we have uh, cities that like after Hungarian, right? Mm -hmm. And it's been like that for hundreds of years, actually, you know? And that was okay. I think that, okay, it is okay. Only recently, uh, many people have double passport uh, but only recently it became a problem when when this situation with russia started when we get, got into our trouble and uh, we started slowly noticing that hungary pays more and more attention to ukraine it's like unwanted attention you know and uh, it makes me think actually uh, well that um relationship between hungary and russia they are well what was good, right? And uh, maybe it's just like my paranoia or something, but do you feel kind of that um, Hungary is kind of following Russian path and they want to implement some of changes like to be? Yeah, that, definitely, that's why I, that's why I showed some like think tanks, media outlets, uh, 
But we are using all kinds of Russian help we can about like, you know, making this system stable. And, uh, you know, they are financing us heavily. They are building a new nuclear plant to us um, for the, with a secret loan. They are put in, they put some big uh, international development bank of theirs into Budapest in the last weeks. Um, uh, we are using all, the, all kinds of their faith experts uh, to make our policies sound uh, to the internal community or even to the UN or anything. Um, yeah, and uh, we are really closely connected, and uh, but you know we are not ideologically connected. That uh, uh, the, all the government media is like uh, about that Putin and Orban, the two the two true defenders of Christianity, are against the waves of immigration. But uh, but it can change in a couple of years if somebody offers more money, they will change that. Thing. I think we will have Yeah, oh, sorry. What's in your opinion holding back the Hungarian spam revolution? Well, you already mentioned since you're located in, the, in Europe, in that continent, it tends to be a democratic continent. And you already mentioned that you wouldn't interfere in internal, uh, internal uh, systems. But what if the movement is internal? Wouldn't they be backed up, backed up by uh, the EU? Um, you know, that's why it is good that you have a tiny opposition in the parliament because uh, you can you can really pacify them with that, that there is always a chance to win on the elections. So if you have a chance to win on basically three elections, then then, it, then the chance of revolution is really, really slow, no, like really low. Like if you think about the Arab Spring or like all kinds of orange revolution or rose revolution, any colored revolution, um, all the dictators were like quite unaware that what is happening underground, how is the opposition or NGOs uh, organizing mm -hmm. the, the people for a revolution. It just doesn't happen like from this day to the next. Usually, if you can pacify and monitor closely your opposition, you will get the signs that oh, they are, there is a big, uh, I don't know, an acceptance of certain policies or stuff like that, you can just abolish that and continue or just give some money to the people instantly that they hear some gift from the government. Let's do one more question, then we can continue this informally. Okay. You, 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 you. Okay. Well, uh, just one comment and one questionnaire. Okay. Well, uh, interesting that uh, Russia is the second after the US by number of undocumented immigrants. So I think it's not the best example <laughs> of immigration policy. And the question is, I know that um, the as I know, the biggest uh, opposition force in Hungary is actually a right, like far right, uh, uh, or uh, Jobbik, Jobbik yeah. party. And uh, uh, could you just tell us, uh, is it a, a also a fake opposition, or uh, how would you describe the cooperation and competition with uh, Fidesz? Mm. Um, yo, so Jobbik was a far right, really radical right party mm -hmm. with the main, uh, main offer that if they will get elected, we have only one minority uh, actually in Hungary, the, the Roma people, the gypsies, about 1% of the population, they are really poor. Um, and uh, for radical right, the Slovak, the gypsies were the scapegoats, and their only main promise was that they will make a second uh, police who will, whose main purposes will be just beat up the gypsies basically regularly. And, uh, and they got like, quite popular with that idea. Uh, because Hungarian police is actually not functioning really well. Um, but the, and they were also heavily financed by, directly by uh, Russian entities. But um, I, th I guess like uh, maybe Fidesz had made a different deal with Russia or these Russian entities, but their financing uh, obviously stopped and they are falling now apart. And also Fidesz is fight, even Fidesz, the government party is, is helping another opposition radical right wing party that they control more closely to attack this radical party, so they will just fall apart in a couple of years, probably. Thank you all for coming, and please continue to follow us on social media. We have all the conversations on our YouTube channel, Talk at HHH, and this one will be there. If not today, then tomorrow, if you want to go back and listen to the presentations. And thank you again. Okay. Thank you very much.
and then like you know the Besides, we, have, we don't have 